Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inuser Education. Um, I think it's time to solve a few problems and um, I am planning actually to solve um, some difficult problems as well. But today it, won't, it, it will not be very difficult. It will probably be some kind of a repetition of whatever we were talking about um, the forces and the force, for, force field potential. Um, so um, I think it will be very useful as a kind of a recap of whatever we were talking about um, forces and potentials. Um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics Plus, actually Classics Physics Plus. Um, it's presented on unizor.com. Um, I suggested to go to website um, and choose the Classic Physics Plus as a course. Now, um, this particular lecture belongs to um, the part called Laws of Newton, which is basically a repetition of whatever we know, maybe a little bit more. Um, and then, uh, after that, that would be problems, Laws of Newton problems number one um, lecture. Um, I, I have to tell that there are prerequisites to this course. Um, I assume as basically known to you um, uh, all the material which is presented in the uh, course Math for Teens and Physics for Teens. So um, these two courses are, well, high school and a little bit above the high school level. But uh, whatever is presented in those courses I assume as basically known to you and I'm not going to to basically explain uh, some small details about, I know, what's a differential or uh, what's a vector product or something like this. I assume all this is known to you. So this is, that's why it's called Physics Plus, Classic Physics Plus. Okay, so, um, oh, I didn't mention actually that the unizor.com is totally free, there are no advertisement, sign-in is not really necessary. Um, so, uh, if you're just studying it your, yourself, just go and, and do whatever is necessary, um, watch the lectures. Um, every lecture has notes for this particular lecture, so you have on the same screen you have the video presentation and textual part which basically contains the same thing in a textbook style. So, now let's start. Okay, now my only problem today is to prove that gravitational uh, force is conservative. Now, what does it mean conservative? Well, obviously it means that it preserves the, the energy, the conservation of energy, um, but it, in more detailed way it's basically the following. If you have gravitational force and I will consider only the force around some material point, uh, uh, m m mass point of mass m, and the force around it, so it's uh, spherically symmetrical. Um, and uh, the problem is that if you have two points, A and B, and you have move an object within this um, gravitational field, Along some, category, uh, along some trajectory from A to B, then the energy you spend um, would not depend on the trajectory, only on the points uh, A and B. So if you go along the straight line, or if you go along this line, the total amount of work will be the same. Okay, so these are so-called conservative forces. So I have to prove that the force which is gravitational force which is exerted by a point mass of mass m is uh, conservative. Okay. Now, if you remember when I introduced the concept of field the first time, I said that well the field obviously is part of the our three dimensional Euclidean space where there is a vector of force which is defined at, at, po at every point uh, of this area 
and there is a function which I called u, a scalar function, not a vector, such that f is equal to uh, gradient of u. Now, gradient means that the first derivative um, by x with a minus sign is the first component, component f. This is a vector, so it has three components. <coughs> y is equal to minus du of x, y, z, obviously. by du, by dy, and of z equals to minus du by dz. So that's how I defined the field. So there is a force, and there is a function which I call potential, um, gr gradient of, OK, I, again, I have to put minus here as well. Negative gradient of it, of this function u, is the force. Now, the gradient means three components and the three components. <coughs> so, the gradient is a vector and the function is a vector. So, if this is true, then I have proven that uh, uh, the, force, the force F is conservative. So, if you have two points within this field where the, the force S, F is defined, then the work along any path from point A to point B would depend only on point A and B. A, A and B. Okay. Well, and incidentally, if you go along the closed trajectory, it would be zero, because you go this way, and then you go the opposite way. It doesn't really matter which trajectory you take, but if it's, uh, if it's an opposite way, that would be a negative uh, amount. So it would be plus and minus, so it would be zero. So this is all given. I already covered it in the lecture which was called um, Field and Potential. So what does it mean? It means that to prove that the function um, uh, force F, the vector, uh, the vector force, is conservative, it's sufficient to find some kind of a scalar uh, function negative gradient of which is equal to f. So, I'll just find it, basically. Given the gravitational point, gravitational field, I know that at every point, I know what the gravitational force is. That's the uh, law of uh, Newton uh, uh, about the gravitation. So, I know the force. All I have to do is to find a function which serves as a potential the negative gradient of which is equal to the gravitational force. Okay, so I'll just give this function basically. I know this function, so I'll just give it to you. Doesn't matter how I have found it. I'll, I'll later cover this. But basically, I know the function. Alright, so let's just think about how to find this function and prove that its negative gradient is equal to gravitational force. Okay. First of all, what do, what do we know about um, the law of gravitation? Well, we know that the force um, is equal to a universal gravitational constant, mass of the um, uh, object which is basically the source of the gravitational field, and we assume this is a point mass, obviously, then the mass of our test object, um, which is in the gravitational field, and we will be moving it around to generate some work, divided by r square, where r is the distance between um, point masses, the source of the field and the test ob object. That's basically the gravitational law of Newton. Now, so the first thing which we will do, we will have a system of coordinates in our space centered at 
where the source of the gravitational field is. That's just easier. So the gravitational uh, force um, starts basically the, the source of the field is at point zero zero zero. And let's assume that our so this is where the uh, source of gravitational field which has a mass m capital M. Now the test object is at position x y z. Okay, then r is a distance, so r is basically equal to x square plus y square plus z square square root, right? That's the distance from point zero to point x y z. So we know basically how. Uh, um, the magnitude of the gravitational force looks. That's the magnitude of the force. Now, this is a vector, so we need actually to express it as a vector. Okay, so why don't we do it the following way? I will have vector r, uh, which is basically x, y, z. So that's the vector from my uh, zero point to x, y, z where my uh, test object is located. Now, the length of this vector obviously is this. So vector f, so again I will use this without this arrow as a, basically a magnitude, and this would be a vector. It has three components. Now what kind of vector this is. Well, I know its magnitude, and I know the direction of this vector is from um, test object to the source of the gravitational field, because it attracts, right? So, along the same line, I have vector r, right? So, you have, if, I, if I have two objects, now this is at 0, 0, 0, this is this x, y, z, and I know that the force goes this way. This is my force. Now, the also I have r this way. So, what I'm suggesting is vector r divided by r. So, this is the vector r, and I divide it by its length. It's basically a unit length of a vector directed from 0 to x, y, z. Now, if I will um, put a minus, then it would be unit vector directed towards. And since it's a unit vector, if I will multiply it by f, which is the magnitude of my uh, gravitational force, I will get the vector f, right? So this is a unit vector directed towards um, 0 from x, y, z, and if I will multiply it by magnitude of vector f, which I know, I will get the vector. Vector times scalar gives me a vector. So, I can write now that f is equal to minus g m m divided by r to the third degree second times r, that would be third degree, and times r because of this. So this is my vector. Okay, so I have a vector r, I have a vector f. Now I have to find function u, the negative gradient of which is equal to this. Okay. Um, so what I will do is, I will just consider this particular piece. This is the variable piece, right? Because this is a constant. I can always multiply my function by the constant, so it, its gradient will be multiplied by the same constant. So I will try to find the function, the gradient of which is equal to this one. Now, what is this vector? Well, that's x divided by um, 
x square plus y square plus z square to the power of 3 seconds, right? r is x plus x square plus y square plus z square to the power of 1 half and um, times uh, uh, power 3, that would be 3 halves. Okay, fine. Now the second component would be y divided by the same thing and z divided by the same thing. That's what this vector is about. I mean just this part, r divided by r cubed. So these are supposed to be partial derivatives of some function. All right, so I know the function. The function is x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the power of one half, mi minus one half. Now, what is the partial derivative by x? Well, first, this is a power fun fun function with a power, so it's minus one half times the same thing to the power of um, uh, minus one half minus one, so it's minus three half, and times derivative of inner function. The inner function, I partial derivative by x, that's two, uh, x squared, so the partial derivative by x would be two x. Look at this and look at this. Well, two and two goes out, so the difference is only in sign. And by the way, this thing, I'll call it R of X, Y, Z. So the partial derivative of R of X, Y, Z by DX is almost this. The difference is only this minus sign. So I will, check, I, I will put minus sign here. So I will have a minus, minus. And then my partial derivative would be equal exactly this one, x divided by x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the power of 3 seconds, okay? So I basically found the function, because with y it will be the same thing. With a uh, partial derivative by y would be, in, in the denominator would be the same thing, and then I will multiply by partial derivative by y, which is 2y and again 2 and 2 will uh, cancel out, etc. So my function, this function, now how I can actually express this a little better, the x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the, pi to the power of 1 half is r. So minus 1 half with 1 over r. So basically r, I can say is function of r, it's minus 1 r. It's a very simple expression, all right? Okay, now, using this, uh, I can just multiply by gmm, and I, pu I put my function u of x, y, z, or if you wish, u of um, uh, r, actually, because it's this function of one argument. It's really a function of, uh, of, of this. It would be uh, 1, well, G, yeah, the multiplier, G, M, M. Um, I do need the minus sign, right? Minus sign. And um, 1 over R, basically. Or, if you wish, minus G, M, 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 1 over square root of X square plus Y square plus Z square. So that's the function, partial derivative of which is equal to my uh, force. Partial derivative by x is equal to x component, partial derivative of y is equal to y component, etc. Well, I would probably can say, <laughs> yeah, I, I can say, okay, this is the proof, basically. I have found the function, the negative gradient of which is equal to 
uh, my uh, force, the gravitational force. So that's the end of the proof, because we have proven before that if the function has this property, that it, it can be expressed as a negative gradient of potential, then the uh, force is conservative. All right. But I don't want you to <laughs> basically think that this is some kind of a, I, I just guessed it. I didn't really guess, obviously, this function. Now, if you remember, when I was proving, actually, that um, there, are, there are two theorems. The, the theorem which I was talking about before was that if there is a potential, then the force is conservative. And then I had another proof that if the force is conservative, then it's, uh, um, it, it has a potential. So during these proofs, I was basically talking about the following. How to find this potential function. I, I, I suggested the following, that if the force is conservative, then I would take two points, just have the work of this point. Now, this is the beginning, let's say point A, and this is the end of the um, trajectory, point B. If the force is conservative and does not depend on trajectory, only on points A and B, I will just have the work from A to B as this potential function u. And that's how I found basically the function that if the force is conservative, then function is this one. Now, I know that this force, how it's expressed. So I will act, I will, I, 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 I can really calculate the work of this force from point to point and find this particular function. So I did it, well, not I, before me, people did it. And they found that this particular function is exactly expressing some work which somebody does when it moves the point within the gravitational mass point within the gravitational uh, field from one point to another. Okay, so let's do it, and I will show you how how it was actually done the first time. So the first time they have decided, okay, what we will do is we will move the point from the point uh, in space where the gravity is basically zero, which is infinity, to some point with coordinates x, y, z. Now, I'll do it much easier, uh, since I know that the field is basically conservative, I will do just a straight line. So let's, uh, let's consider we have a straight line from infinity to the point x, y, z and somewhere on this line there is zero. So from infinity to x, y, z. Okay, now, what is the work? The work is integral from infinity to, and this is r, from infinity to r, force, which is G M M. I put it out of the integral. Um, one r square times d r. Why? Because whenever, well, I should I should put the r here. Let's use some other letter, since r is my limit of integration. Let's say it's s x square and d x. Well. That's probably also not a good thing because x is coordinates. So let's put s and s, okay? All right, so the function is at the, uh, at the, um, at the distance s, the function of, uh, which describes the force is one over s squared with this multiplier, right? That's the magnitude. And ds is differential of distance. So this is amount of work which the force of gravity performs on this particular distance. And then I integrate it from minus infinity to r. So what happens? G m m. Now how can I get 1 over s square uh, integral from it? It's uh, minus 1 over s, right? Uh, from infinity to r. This, that's the function of Newton-Leibniz. 
if the uh, derivative of this is equal to this, then the integral is um, value of this um, function uh, in limits from from infinity to r. So the upper limit is obviously g m m uh, minus divided by r. The ro lower limit, if s is infinity, then the whole thing is zero. So that's how I got this. And that's how I got this, basically. Or this. That's exactly what it is. So that's how people have first understood what is basically a potential. Now, why is it minus? That's probably, it might bother you a little bit. It bothered me. Well, think about it this way. Now, it's supposed to be the work which we do moving from, from, from A to B, right? The work. That's what basically potential is supposed to be. Okay. That's how we proved that stationary uh, mm, uh, conservative uh, conservative force um, has a potential. Okay, now this is the work which we perform. But look at it this way: if my point is at mine at at at, uh, at infinity, and I'm supposed to move it to some point closer to the source, who is doing the job? I am not really doing my work because the field itself is pulling. So, <coughs> if I had to really pull it outside, uh, in the opposite direction, then I would do the work. But if I'm not doing, and the field doing my work, then that's why it's negative. So again, it's supposed to be the work, which some kind of an outside person, or outside whatever entity is doing the work. But now, in this particular case, uh, it, the field itself pulling my object because the uh, uh, gravitational field is attractive. So that's why it's negative. So that's a, a perfectly reasonable uh, explanation. Um, and then again, if I have to really do it, let's say along some closed um, uh, trajectory, let's say I move it back and forth. Well, the total amount of work would be zero because on one way I would do the job and on another way the field will do the job. So I will do negative job, so to speak. So whenever the field is doing my job, then my job is negative. So that's an explanation. Okay, basically now I think I have kind of gave some reasonable explanation why I have chosen this function right like, like immediately, like I guessed it. I didn't really guess it. So that's really the um, the reason where I got it from. It's the work, and I just calculated this integral, and that's how I received it. Again, not me. There's some smart people before me. Okay, that's it for today, and uh, I promise to give you some more more interesting, maybe more difficult problems in the future. So thanks very much, and good luck. <laughs>